So we'll talk a little bit about the introduction to splicing while we wait for Callisto to index the, the human transcriptome, um, something to pass the time. Um, so this is much like uh, many of the other modules. Um, um, it's going to build on what we've already been doing. We're going to pretty much be using the same the same tool that we've already been using, which is string tie. We're just going to run it in a few different modes that kind of gear it towards transcript discovery a little bit more um, and have it be a little bit less guided by our prior knowledge of the transcriptome. The same principles of, of these uh, uh, tutorials apply where we want it to be kind of self-explanatory and self-contained. Um, as I said, we're going to use string tie. We're going to run it in um, kind of a, a reference only mode where we're telling it hey, we think we have a pretty good idea of what the transcriptome looks like. Ensemble or RefSeq or whoever has already done a great job of annotating where the transcripts are and what their sequences are. So just focus on those sequences. Even though we're giving you reads that were aligned against the whole genome and they could have gone anywhere, really focus on the known transcripts. Um, but of course that sort of limits your uh, ability to discover totally new things that maybe aren't even represented in your GTF file and it's entirely possible that you have RNA-seq reads that are aligning to a region of the genome that seem to be aligning in things that look like exons uh, and basically look like a region that's being transcribed that just hasn't been uh, annotated by Ensemble yet uh, and this is one of the features of string ties that it can do that sort of de novo analysis via RNA-seq data against uh, a reference genome. And it's one of the reasons that you're willing to sort of expend the computational cost of doing things that way is to, to leave the door open to discover new genes, discover new transcript isoforms of those genes. Um, so just to remind ourselves what, we were, what we've been talking about until this day. So we were really focused on uh, interrogating uh, RNA reads that came from fragmented versions of these mature uh, RNA transcripts. Uh, so we've, we have uh, RNAs that were converted to cDNA and the cDNA was fragmented and then we're sequencing those fragments. Um, but we've kind of, uh, to this point, generally been assuming that there's sort of one way that this is being done or if there are different ways we already know about them. But of course, there are generally, for most human genes, multiple ways that the pre-mRNA can be spliced together to form the mature mRNA. So some genes will have two, three, ten... 20 different transcripts that use different combinations of exons or different edges of those exons. Uh, and that's what we're going to uh, do a brief int intro to in this uh, module. Um, so just to, just to go over the, the sort of general types of alternative splicing or alternative expression, I've broken it down into eight general categories, and this is pretty consistent with the way a lot of people do it. Um, so there's four on this slide, and then there'll be four on the next slide. The first one is just a sort of a reference point. So simple transcription, we have a, an imaginary gene with three exons and two introns. It's got a transcription start site and a polydenylation site. It gets spliced together by removing the first and the second intron. Now our three exons are put together and it's capped and polyadenylated and it gets exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm uh, where it can be translated. Um, but we can also have alternative transcript initiation where there's two possible choices for the, the first exon. So transcription, uh, the transcriptional machinery might initiate here and use this exon, which will then get spliced onto two and three, or it could initiate at the second exon, and then it's, of course, not going to have that, that first exon. And this will give you two isoforms, uh, one that has three exons and one that has two exons with alternate transcript initiation sites. This is called alternate transcript initiation or alternate TSS usage. Alternative splicing, so we've looked at an example briefly in IGV uh, of this, this type where we have a cassette exon where there's effectively two paths through the same combination of exons. So we have our three exons, sometimes exon two is skipped and sometimes exon two is included. The same transcript initiation site and the same polyadenylation site are used for both so the sort of outer bounds of the the transcripts are the same, but there's something happening in the middle where exons are being uh, ex excluded or, or included. And in this case, this very simple case, you get a transcript with three exons or you get a transcript with two exons where the second transcript has been skipped. So of course, this is a simplified example. Most human genes have you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 exons, and they're in some cases of this huge combinatorial uh, possible uh, number of possibilities where 
many exons are skipped or included in different combinations, uh, and that's what gives you the large number of distinct transcripts for some, uh, some loci. Uh, you can also have the cases where you have the same number of total exons, but the edges of the exon that are used are slightly different. So in this case, we're depicting a different alternative uh, five prime splice site being used or a different, uh, a different donor site being used effectively. Uh, so the, the donor site could be here at the edge of this blue part or, or over here at the, the right hand side of the blue part. And this gives us two isoforms that have uh, three exons each, but in one case the second exon is extended uh, on the three prime side. And then you can have the same concept uh, at the other side, uh, in this case at the acceptor side, uh, where you have uh, alternative acceptor site usage, uh, giving you uh, alternative isoforms, again, with the, in this case, the same number of exons, but slightly different edges of those exons being used. You can have mutually exclusive exons. This is sort of a modification of the cassette exon form where uh, you're gonna produce two transcripts that each have three exons, but you're gonna use one of two alternate uh, second exons. Um, and then you can retain the entire intron. Uh, this generally only usually happens with smaller introns. You don't generally see a uh, 50kb intron being retained, at least not in a, in a functional transcript. That might be a way of effectively silencing the transcript by triggering nonsense mediated decay. Um, so you see that as well. Um, but basically you go from having three exons to having uh, two exons where one is uh, a very large one, and it's a sort of superset of exon 2 and 3 plus the in intron in between. And then finally, the sort of uh, corresponding uh, version of the alternative transcript initiation at, at the uh, five prime side, at the three prime end, you can have alternative polyadenylation sites where effectively you end at an earlier exon or at an earlier part uh, of the last exon. Uh, giving you different three prime tails on transcripts. And some of these can be quite dramatic. So there are uh, known human genes, for example, where you have a 20 exon form and a 30 exon form. And the reason is that one of two polyadenylation sites is being used. Uh, in some cases, that's functional. So you may be basically chopping off something that would localize that protein to a particular part of the cell when the full length version is there. Uh, and the protein goes to a different part of the cell when the, the, full, when the uh, shorter form is used. Okay, so that's a sort of a crash course in the terminology of the, the types and forms of alternative splicing. There's a huge number of, of methods and tools that attempt to utilize RNA-seq data to study splicing. Uh, and there's a couple reviews um, and blogs that, that sort of try to keep track of these tools and Biostar posts. Uh, and these slides here are just really to, to refer you to uh, some of those materials. So we've compiled this list of uh, alternative splicing related uh, Biostars posts that list sort of uh, methods and approaches uh, and tools that are sort of designed with alternative splicing in mind. Over the years that the sequencing methods that are used to study alternative isoforms have really changed a lot. Uh, where we are now is down here with the Selexor Illumina reads, the sort of millions and millions of short reads that we're assembling uh, into uh, isoform transcript information. Uh, but I think it's useful to still think about those sort of longer sequencing technologies that are still quite relevant to alternative splicing uh, because it really is hard to do full length cDNA sequence inference from these short reads. Um, RNA-seq is pretty amazing, um, but it's still, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty still when you're trying to predict what a full length transcript looks like. Uh, so you may, if you're interested in a particular transcript that's been predicted, you're probably going to wind up wanting to validate it somehow, get a sense of what the full length transcript looks like. Uh, and I think there are some other technologies that are starting to become more useful. Uh, I think the PacBio, for example, is pretty good at generating long sequences for a smaller number of, uh, of reads. So there might be uh, a smart way to use Illumina sequencing and pack biosequencing sort of in combination to study isoform diversity where you really need to have longer range information about how all of the exons are connected in a transcript. Uh, and I think there's a lot of interest in the, the nanopore sequencer also perhaps filling this role where we could uh, in theory start to feed full length cDNAs into these nanopore sequencers and read off the, the, the complete exon intron structure um, instead of having to piece it together from these small fragments that we sequenced by Illumina sequencing. Um, but it's still kind of early days for, for those two things. But I think it's a, an area of opportunity to, to do some interesting analysis. So the last module 
Um, so back to our, our sort of flow chart here. Um, we're basically going to repeat what was done uh, previously uh, with string tie using some slightly different parameters. Um, and then just to go into the details of those parameters a little bit more, um, there's a last uh, deck, slide deck with a few slides here. Um, Okay, so we've already learned how to run string tie in reference only modes. So remember, we've labeled our string tie output directory as ref only. That was in anticipation of producing kind of parallel results that we're gonna that we're gonna generate now, and we're gonna do that by running in the sort of reference guided and de novo mode, uh, and then we're gonna use cuff merge to combine uh, transcriptome predictions from multiple runs of of string tie. Sorry, that's a hasn't been updated yet, and then we're going to learn how to perform differential splicing analysis. And then we'll also do some visualization in uh, IGV uh, and examine some junction files. Uh, we've already done a little bit of that. Um, looks like this slide deck has actually not been updated. There is an updated version, but somehow it hasn't been copied over. Um, so I think what I'll do is skip that slide and because there are, there's something very comparable to string type, but it's not quite the same. Um, we're going to look at uh, a junctions bed file. Uh, we're actually, instead of getting one from Top Hat, uh, HiSat doesn't seem to produce this for you directly, so I'll point you to a, an alternate tool that you can use to generate a junctions bed file from um, any uh, BAM file. Uh, and basically the idea of these bed files is to produce these views. So remember we looked at the, those arcs to kind of represent the pattern of sli splicing in IGV. It's basically a way to get that information stored as a file where each line in the file corresponds to a single predicted exon exon connection. Um, so that's what each of these arcs is showing here. And then the sort of weight or darkness of the arc is a representation of how many reads there were that supported each of those unique exon exon combinations. Uh, Cuff merge is kind of a generic tool that's used to basically combine GTF files together, and these GTF files could be from wherever. Um, they could be from string tie, or previously they were from uh, cufflinks, uh, and it kind of has, does two things. It takes two different sets of transcript predictions and merges them into kind of a unified superset of predictions, and it also allows you to compare those predictions against some known transcriptome models, like from the ensemble GTF. Uh, and both of those applications are pretty handy. It's a sort of bit like a way of annotating transcripts that were predicted, merging and annotating. So we're going to do some comparisons of the GTF files that we get out of running string tie in the different modes. And the way we're going to do that is just by sort of browsing around uh, in IGV. And there's some specific regions that we're, you'll be pointed to in the, the online exercises to illustrate uh, some of the differences that come out of these different modes. Uh, we talked a little bit about this already, what to do when you return to your lab and you um, can't get this to work on your own data, which is it's probably inevitable, but that there'll be some problems. Um, I think, as Jared said, you know, you can email us with follow-up questions. You can ask questions on uh, Biostars or Seek Answers, where we're also active, so we might get be one of us that answers your question there. Um, there are some troubleshooting uh, guides for some of these tools. The manuals are pretty good. Um, or they're reasonable, um, but sometimes, it, yeah, the answer isn't there. Google is often the most reliable way of getting uh, answers to specific questions about these tools, just because their things tend to be changing quite quickly. Mm -hmm.